Oh, okay. well, I don't have it very close. These directional mics are finicky. But um, what I would recommend is if you have a an app or some sort of device on your phone, you could probably even get on YouTube and find the they they have the readings of the scripture all the time. Is to listen to the book of Isaiah. Um, listen to it without chapter breakups. Just listen to it. Think about the flow of it. Um, it's difficult to grab because Isaiah uses so many metaphors. He was he was very metaphorical in everything he did was like this and like that and as a mighty river and as a small stream and uh, <clears throat> is very uh, flowing language but you'll get the feel for it if you listen to it rather than try to read the breakups <clears throat> um, so we'll be in chapter 7 this morning chapter 7, 8, 9 and no 7, 8, and 10, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> all right, so what we're going to do in this next portion, um, I've, I've been in a, a great struggle, Brother Steve, because I would like to, as I study it, part of me wants to just walk through it verse by verse, thought by, I mean, just, just walk. But I don't know that that would be as beneficial as the way we're doing it, taking large chunks of it and seeing how the themes flow through it. So, <clears throat> 7 through 10, um, I think we'll take in two parts. The first part is going to be basically, um, <clears throat> we're going to focus on what is actually happening and um, the Lord's role through it all. And then, <clears throat> possibly next le lesson I get into we're going to jump back into it grab the messianic themes and then I would like to tie in chapters 11 and 12 with that at the same time and chapter 9 um, so <clears throat> that's kind of the idea of where we're going it's uh, uh, the book of Isaiah is not doesn't lend itself to chapter and verse like the epistles do brother Steve it just doesn't um, <clears throat> so having said that let's jump into chapter 7 verse 1 <clears throat> excuse me chapter 7 verse 1 I don't um, I think we'll just read I don't know if I read the whole thing I may just not even read a whole lot of it at all and it came to pass in the days of Ahaz the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Reason, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up uh, toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. <clears throat> and it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. Um, you'll notice through the prophets a lot of times, and uh, sometimes in Kings and Chronicles, that when they say Ephraim, that kind of includes all of Israel. That's just the name they, they throw at it. Um, <clears throat> and now he's talk, it was told to the house of David. Now this is an important statement. And his heart was moved, and the heart of his people, that's the house of David, that would be Jerusalem, uh, as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. And, uh, and now... <clears throat> this is not just referring to one person. This is primarily the people of that area. Their, all their heart was moved. It was, this was a, a greatly disturbing thing, and we're going to look at that. Uh, then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now uh, to meet Ahaz, thou in Shear Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, uh, for the fierce anger of reason with Syria and of the son of <clears throat> Remaliah. That's the king of Israel um, at that time. <clears throat> because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah 
have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us. Uh, they're going to break into uh, Jerusalem and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. And I'm not sure who that is. No one, I think, is really terribly sure who that is. But we know that it's not who God chose to be king. Uh, thus saith the Lord God. Uh, now, these, there, there's an important thing to keep in mind as you read through these things that we don't think about often because we're Westerners. And, Ron, we have elections, and elections have consequences. Right, Brother Steve? I think Obama said that. Anyway, and so our, our, our entire thought process of, is one uh, that is completely different than what they would have thought about. Their concern here is the continuation of the house of David. That's who God made the covenant with. That's where the Messiah is going to come through. That's the one that's going to deliver God's people all the way through the history of the Jewish nation. That, that's, that's a big deal. <clears throat> um, that's, that's the one that walked to Calvary, Brother John. It's, it's, a, it's a bigger deal to them uh, than, than we realize. <clears throat> so, uh, where did I leave off? <laughs> Thus saith the Lord, verse 7, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, uh, that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. And if you will, now here's a very important statement. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. <coughs> Moreover, um, let's stop right there. I'm not going to read verse 10. We're going to stop right there, I think. Um, there's a little bit of a, I'm not sure how long the time gap happens between verse 9 and 10, but we're going to break there just for a moment. We're going to, <clears throat> we'll get back into it in just a second. So, between the ending of chapter 6 and what we just read is a 16-year time period. Jotham, the son of uh, Uzziah, takes up the throne uh, from all indications, he was a good, godly man. About all we have talking about him is Second Chron. Well, there's a, there's a, a mention uh, in Second Kings chapter, I believe, fourteen or fifteen, something around there. And in Second Chronicles twenty-seven, we have a very short chapter devoted to his life. For some reason, Brother Steve, that sixteen-year time period, the Lord just didn't want us to know a whole lot about, because Isaiah doesn't even mention it. <clears throat> During that time, uh, there has been political unrest in Israel. There's one conspiracy after another, one king killed after another. And <clears throat> as we come into Ahaz's day, there's a man uh, who is named Pekah, the son of Remaliah, as king. Uh, Reason is the king of a little nation, uh, of a regional power named Syria. Uh, they have joined themselves in a confederacy in a bid to overthrow the southern kingdom of Judah. They march through the land. They march against, uh, and you can study all this if you'd like. I'm paraphrasing just to give you an idea of where he's at in, as we start chapter 7. Um, in 2 Kings chapter 15 and 2 Chronicles 28, we're not, we're not going to take time to read all that because we've got a lot of ground to cover. But they're marching against Jerusalem. Uh, they come against, into Judah, uh, during that time of battle, they slay 120,000 men. They carry 200,000 of the men, women, and children they've caught captives back into Israel. And there was a man, uh, I can't even remember his name off the top of my head, uh, a mighty man of Ephraim. It says in uh, Second Chronicles 28 that kills one of the sons of Ahaz. <clears throat> so... We might say he's having a bad day, Brother Tom. So, <laughs> as those 200,000 men are carried back into Israel, uh, one of the prophets of God, you'll see, you read this in 2 Chronicles 28, stops them and says, Look, I've delivered them into your hands, but you went too far. 
your, your fierce anger has come up before the Lord. You better let these people go or you're going to suffer the judgment of God. Uh, they have a little counsel. Someone uh, who's got a little bit of common sense stands up, talks some sense into them, and they let all the people go back into Judah. And so that's where we find ourselves. Things aren't looking real good at this point. <clears throat> and that's where we find ourselves in chapter 7. Uh, these are the things that are happening during this time. And so, <clears throat> I'm going to read two verses to you and just hang on to them in your memory. Uh, we're going to get to them in a moment. But, but it, this, this, I feel like this is the right time to read those things. Um, Second Kings chapter 15, verse 37. This is the end of Jotham's days as he's dying, or as he's, he dies, and uh, Ahaz becomes king of the southern kingdom of Judah. In, now listen to what scripture says here. In those days, the Lord began to send against Judah, reason the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah. Now, uh, as you walk through these particular passages, chapter 7 and chapter 8 of Isaiah, and then back in Second Chronicles, you find out that these two made a league together. Their goal was to overthrow and set up their own little king down there. They, they wanted to, they had it out for Judah. And, let me find the passage I'm looking for. <clears throat> 2 Chronicles chapter 28, um, verse 9. This is the event I was talking about. The prophet of the Lord was there, whose name was Oded. This is as the 200,000 are being carried back into Samaria, um, or Israel. Uh, and he came out before the host that came to Samaria and said unto them, Behold, because the Lord God of your fathers was wroth with Judah... He hath delivered them into your hand. Now God's angry with his people in Jerusalem. And so he's bringing these kings against them. He delivers them into your hand. And ye have slain them in a rage that reacheth up to heaven. These men are fiercely angry. And now you purpose to keep under the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you. But are there not with you even with you, sins against the Lord your God. He, he's, he's just confronting them. And now he tells them, uh, here, here therefore and deliver the captives again, which you have taken captive of your brethren, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Now God brought them against Judah. Scripture's clear about that. But in their anger and wrath, they're killing people and taking slaves and captives. And God is now angry with them for where their heart's at and what they intend on doing. Now, that's, we're going to get into that eventually, but just, just remember that. That's, that's important to uh, where we go towards, hopefully towards the end of this lesson. So, <clears throat> now we're back in chapter 7 of Isaiah. And um, in Isaiah, God tells Isaiah to go down and confront Ahaz. And now there's something important in here, and we're going to look at it as we, as we move down through here. And uh, he takes his son, Shear Jashub. Um, Gary, that's, that's a good name for your firstborn, Shear Jashub. But God, remember we looked at that passage in chapter 8 where he talked about his, his family was for signs uh, to Israel. Shear Jashub means uh, a remnant is going to return. A remnant shall return. Uh, that, that's the literal meaning of the name. <clears throat> and he says, uh, he tells him to go down to a specific place. The end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the Fuller's Field. Now, I had no idea, other than from where, other than reading scripture, Brother John, I've never heard of a Fuller. Having studied scripture, I, I know what a fuller is. I'm assuming that's a pretty old term. Brother Steve, did they have fullers when you were a kid? Like your cup was fuller than your brother's? <laughs> a fuller was someone that 
uh, whitened clothes, bleached them, uh, made them. What's that? They had one. They had a fuller in town. Mm. So a fuller was someone that cleaned and and scrubbed the clothing. I guess made them made them clean and pure. Uh, so Isaiah is instructed. Now remember in chapter six. This and I'm just I'm only pointing this particular passage out because I want you to see. Uh, I'm trying to to highlight the themes, the, the, the way the book of Isaiah unfolds. I'm not going to do, do this for every single passage, but I want you to pay close attention to this because in chapter 6, he was told, Go tell this people, hear ye indeed and understand not, see indeed and perceive not, make the heart of this people fat, uh, make their ears heavy, shut their eyes lest they see with their ears, hear with their, uh, or see with their eyes, excuse me, it'd be interesting to see with your ears, see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. God gave him a mission. Go, and, and we looked at the principle behind all that when Jesus confronted the Jews. Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe. And so, house of David, it's real important. That's the covenant family. That's, that's the line the Messiah is coming through. <clears throat> he takes... They're all in an uproar. Ahaz, all the people of the area, because at this time, Pekah uh, and Reason are coming against them. There's a conspiracy. Uh, they're, they're, I mean, the intention is to overthrow the king of Judah and put someone on the throne. That's the intended purpose of this war. So, Judah being much smaller than Israel, naturally, is, he's fearful. Brother Steve, his, his, literally, his kingdom, his kingship, his family, is at jeopardy. And for all practical purposes, it looks like he's probably going to lose. I mean, if you have 120,000 of your best soldiers killed and 200,000 people, that's 350,000 just yanked violently out of your kingdom. It's not looking too promising, Gary. It's, 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 this is where he's at. And so Isaiah shows up with his little son at a certain place with a certain message. And we've got to ask ourselves, What's the significance of all that? Why, why in the world would God do this, Brother Nathan? Uh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But the more I studied it, the more I understood it. Now the name of his son, a remnant, shall return. If Ahaz was smart enough to pick up on that, and I'm, I'm assuming he was, He's probably even more nervous, Ron. What do you mean a remnant's going to return? <laughs> the rest of us going too? And Isaiah meets him. Look at the location that he meets him in. His message is, take heed and be quiet. Fear not. He's obviously afraid. It said their heart was moved like the wind. These smoking fire brands. God's big enough to take care of them. That's what he's saying. They're going against Jerusalem. They want to, verse 7, he says, Don't, don't, thus saith the Lord, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. And he goes ahead and tells them what he can do to it. And he, and he gives him, he confronts him in verses 10 and 11. Uh, and we didn't read those, but he says, uh, and we're going to as we walk through here, but I wanted to lay this foundation. Um, ask a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth down as low as you can go, or in the height above. Ask if the, the prophet comes to him and tells him clearly, God's gonna del God can deliver you easy. Now ask a sign that's going to be just visible. Brother Steve, I'd have said, all right, we'll see something real here. Make, uh, make the sky turn red with purple polka dots and stripes running through it, Brother John. I want to know that the Lord has spoken to me. I want... He had the opportunity here to get whatever sign he wanted and God would prove to him he was going to deliver his people. So Isaiah shows up. He's got his son, remnant shall return. 
and look at its location at the end of the conduit of the upper pool. Now, remember what I said, or what, what Isaiah said, or God said to Isaiah, in what we read in chapter 6, you're going to show them, but they're not going to see or understand. A remnant's going to return, Brother Tom. He's at the end of the conduit from the upper pool. What comes from the upper pool through a conduit? Water. Water from above is coming down to him. Where is he standing? He's at the highway to the fuller's field. What's the fuller do? Well, he washes it pure. He'll wash it clean, Brother Steve. That water's coming down the conduit to the remnant that's going to return on the highway to being washed clean. Now, you'll notice all the way through the book of Isaiah, that highway passage is, it keeps coming up. Well, there's in, in Isaiah chapter 35. See, I got excited studying all this. I, that's why I said I wish I had four hours. This is great stuff. In, in, chapters, uh, or in chapter 35, <clears throat> verses 7 and 8, look what Isaiah says as he's preaching in this. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. Well, where's all that coming from, Brother John? Well, from the pool up above, down the conduit. In the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. All this dead stuff around here, it's going to start growing again. There's going to be some life in it. Oh, and look at what he says in verse, and what's going to be there? A highway shall be there. Well, what's that highway going to do, Brother Steve? Well, it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. This highway, it's the way of holiness. It's the way of cleanness. See, Isaiah brings this theme all the way through his book. And, and so here he is, with, he's picture preaching to Ahaz. That even don't, don't fear. Don't be afraid of all this. Even though it looks like certain destruction's coming. There's going to be some left. They're going to be a remnant saved. They're going to be on their way to holiness. On this highway to the fuller's field. He's, he's picture preaching to him. He's made to see. But he didn't see. Kind of reminds you of the parables. That Jesus told to the Pharisees. Those parables <clears throat> were proof text by that little passage there in Isaiah. Going to make them see, but they won't see. Going to make them see how that is beginning to unfold in Isaiah's message towards these guys. So, <clears throat> then we have here in verse 9 the statement If you will not believe, Surely you shall not be established. And now as we work through the rest of this passage, you're going to see what he's talking about. Moreover, the Lord spoke unto him, saying, Ask thee a sign, whether it be in the depth or the height. And <clears throat> look what Ahaz does. He plays, he plays spiritual like most good God deniers do. I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. I'm not going to tempt the Lord, Nate. I'm above that. You know why? Because we find out in 2 Chronicles chapter 28, he looted the temple, took all the gold, and sent it to Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria, and begged him for help. And then he goes, he, as historical narrative unfolds, he does come down and help, so to speak. He, he, he as it were, rescues Ahaz and Ahaz goes to meet him, sees an altar there, sends back to the priest at home and said, hey, look at this altar, let's set it up in the temple and this is what I want my sacrifices to be offered on. So he rejects the counsel of God to him, goes to Assyria, picks up their worship and that's where we find Ahaz. He's not going to tempt the Lord. So God says, all right, hear ye now, O house of David. He, his message goes beyond Ahaz. O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore, behold, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. We know that means God with us. That's, this is a prophecy of the Messiah. Butter and honey he shall eat that he may know to refuse the evil 
and choose the good. Now this is the sign right here. Remember the mountaintop analogy. As you look at them from a distance, they all look like one long row until you get close. Here's a great place to insert that thought because Isaiah says, <clears throat> before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Now, uh, and then he says, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. He's talking about uh, Pekah and reason, Israel and Syria, the land that you abhor, the ones you hate. They're going to be forsaken of their kings. <clears throat> now that didn't happen. Um, that, that, it's hard to put those two prophecies together because verse 14 happened 700 years later. Now, technically, I guess you could say before Jesus was old enough to refuse the evil and choose good, that the land was forsaken. But most commentators, and I do agree with them, think that um, <clears throat> between verses 15 and 16, Isaiah points out his son, Shir Jia. Before this child shall know to refuse the good and evil, and, or refuse the evil and choose the good, the land thou abhortest shall be forsaken of both our kings. Uh, the Lord shall bring upon thee, and upon now he turns his attention to Ahaz. Remember what he said in verse 9. If you will not believe, you shall not be established. The Lord shall bring upon thee, and upon thy people, and upon thy father's house, Days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. Uh, talking about back in Solomon, or uh, uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam's day. Even the king of Assyria. Now who has he gone to for help? The king of Assyria. Now this is a lot of historical data. And I, I'm trying to, not to overload everyone because we've got we to gotta move fast. I don't have much time. <clears throat> and if you study down through here, you're going to find out that basically what the Lord is saying to him is by the time the king of Assyria gets done with you, you're going to have uh, where you had thousands of vines. There's just going to be uh, brambles and thorns. And there's going to be a few people there. There's going to be a remnant. And they're just going to have a cow and a couple goats. And they're going to eat the bread and, and or they're going to eat butter and milk. And they're going to kind of live on what they got. But all this good stuff you got is going to be gone. The Assyrian king's going to take care of all this. <clears throat> it's going to make a mess out of it. And then, so that brings us into chapter 8. In chapter 8, uh, again, he takes, uh, God gives him uh, a sign. Man, uh, he, he says, write in a, in a man's book, in a, in a scroll, May her shall al hashbez. Longest Hebrew word in the Bible. <clears throat> or longest Bible word is what, what is, the studies have shown um, as I was reading it. Now, that's a. That's a strange name, <clears throat> poor kid. But <clears throat> he's given this name. I skipped over a little stuff, but I'm going to get to it. He's, I think we'll cover some of this when we go back to the second part of the lesson. Now, we don't use the word booty much be because that's an old word. Uh, we use the word spoils, basically the same thing. The name means swift is the spoil or swift is the booty, literally translated into the English. Hasty is the prey. He, he, basically what he's saying is this is going to happen fast. Verse 4, before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. They're all going to be carried away. And this could be what that prophecy in verse 16 is applied to. Uh, either way, um, it's going to happen fast. And so he went into the prophecies she conceived, bear a son, um, <clears throat> and all that happened. Now, <clears throat> verse 5 breaks into an important, there's an important passage in verse 5. And, uh, and, and again, we go back to chapter 7, and you see that even though Ahaz uh, rejected it and he refused it, there's a, there's, there is a, a promise of a coming Messiah. It looks like the family line is going to be destroyed. It's not. Isaiah said there's, there's coming forth a virgin is going to conceive. She's going to bear a son. We're going to call him Emmanuel. He gives you a messianic promise. You'll see that theme over and over all the way through the book of Isaiah. 
Judgment's coming, judgment's coming. God's going to clean your clock. But there's going to be a remnant. Gives a messianic promise. And you'll also notice that that messianic promise is always tied to some, I say always, I, I, I'm not going to say it's a hard, fast rule. But I've noticed as I've studied through this, every time there's a messianic promise given, especially to some of these kings, there's belief or unbelief associated with it. You're going to believe it or you're not going to believe it. You're going to believe that there's one coming that's going to redeem you and forgive you and cleanse all this mess up or clean all this mess up or you're not going to believe it. <clears throat> if you believe, you'll be established. If you don't believe, that which you've relied on, the Assyrian, judgment is coming and I'm going to use that to do so. And that's how it works in the spiritual world. We either believe God's promise through Christ or we don't. And our, we'll get the fruit of our own sin if we reject the gospel. And that's another aspect we'll try to get into eventually is that what Isaiah often spiritualizes what is happening physically and ties it together. So <clears throat> there's just almost too much in here to study. So in chapter 8, verse 6, he brings, he's prophesying judgment upon Israel. Now, think back. <clears throat> Here's where I talked about him using analogies. For as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh that go softly, talking to the people of Israel. That's who he's referring to, those of Samaria and Damascus. They refuse the waters of Shiloh that go softly and rejoice in reason in Remaliah's son. Reason, the king of Syria, uh, Pekah, the son of Remaliah. They're rejoicing in those. They refuse the waters that go softly. What did they want to do? They wanted to overthrow the house of David and set their own king up. What's the house of David associated with? The messianic promise. What do people want to do every day in their own lives? They want to overthrow everything that God has promised and set themselves up as king. This is, draw the analogy all the way through this. <clears throat> so, for as much as they've rejected the promised Messiah, family, all that, they want to overthrow it, they want to set up their own king, they've rejected that. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord's going to bring upon them, verse 7, the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria in all his glory, and he shall come up over his bank, over his channel, and go over all the banks. God's going to bring this river on them. You've rejected the soft stream of the Messiah. Fine. Here comes the flood of judgment. That's what's coming. Come on in and sit down, Bill. And sneak in. We, I try not to point you out, all right? I try not to embarrass you. I don't embarrass guys. I don't like to embarrass guys bigger than me. So, all right. So God's going to bring upon them uh, the Assyrian, the judgment. Hmm. I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff because I want to get to chapter 10 real fast. How much time do I got? I got 10 minutes. All right. I'm skipping some stuff because um, basically those things apply. Isaiah repeats his theme over and over again through this. All right. That brings us to chapter 10. <clears throat> And we're going to read, the, uh, let me read the, we're in Isaiah chapter 10. Verse 1, woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees. Now, and that right grievousness which they have prescribed to turn aside the needy. Basically, he's rebuking those that write unrighteous decrees, un un long, ungodly laws that, that do, what he's doing is comparing and contrasting, and we'll get into it. I'm going to skip a lot of it because I'm getting down to verse 5. He's comparing and contrasting what men do to what God does. And now remember the two verses we read about in, uh, in 2 Kings chapter, whatever it was, in 2 Chronicles 27, I think, or 28, where God said he sent those two kings against Judah. But then when they plundered Judah, because for judgment, he was judging Judah. And when they, when, they, when they killed all them men and took 200,000 people back to Israel, the prophet rebuked them and said, look, 
God give them into your hand, but your heart is wicked. You're killing these people. You've went too far in a rage. You've done this. And God threatened to judge them for their actions, even though he sent them against Judah. He was going to judge them for the actions of their heart. This brings us to the theme that I want to get before we close, because you'll find this all the way through the book of Isaiah, is that the sovereign control of God over everything. Now, we've looked at the judgment on Ahaz because of his unbelief, and he turned to the Assyrian army, he, gave them, he looted the temple, gave them all the money, and God has said, the Assyrians are coming against you, and they're going to leave this place pretty much desolate. It's going to be a, a pretty sad state of affairs. And here we have verse 5. Let's, let's just read it and walk through it. O Assyrian. Now Isaiah is kind of, uh, you can see him just kind of, kind of going into this prophecy there. The rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. Now this is what God is saying about the Assyrian nation. You are the rod of my anger and the staff that's your, in your hand is my indignation. I will send him, the Assyrian king, take last Pileser that we looked at earlier, against an hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil, to take the prey, to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Here's what God said I'm going to do. I'm going to give, I'm going to send him against my people for judgment and they're going to tread them down like, like, like mud. Verse 7. How be it, he meaneth not so. The Assyrian king didn't get up in the morning, Brother John, and go, you know, I'm going to do the will of God this morning and go against Israel. He didn't do that. You know what he meant? Neither doth his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. He got out of bed and said, I think I'm just going to take the world and kill anyone in my way. Look what, look what he does. For he saith, are not my princes altogether kings? Even the princes in my kingdom are kings. This is how good I am. This is how powerful I am. Is not Calno as Carchemish and Hamath as Arpad? Is not Samaria as Damascus? As my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols, and whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and of Samaria. They got far better looking idols than Jerusalem's got. I mean, they got big golden ones, and I wiped them out. Shall not I, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols? I, I mean, Samaria's got much better looking gods than Israel's, or Judah's got, and I've wiped them out, so I'm going to go down there and take them too. This is what he's going to do. He's going to do, th he, I mean, he, he had no idea. He didn't even care that he was being used of God. Wherefore, here's what God says about the whole thing. And this is why I brought up that, those two passages from the previous event. Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. God's using him to judge his people and then going to punish him for the attitude and the wickedness and the ungodliness and the pride of his own heart. And this is an important thing. We're going to walk through the rest of the past year. But this is an important thing to remember in the book of Isaiah as you study through it. Is that Isaiah understands God is in complete control of everything. That is why he can say over and over and over again, judgment's coming, God's going to wipe this thing out, but there's going to be a remnant, even when it doesn't look like there's going to be a remnant. Even when it looks like, uh, just like Ahaz, he's, he's scared to death. Pika and this other king are coming against him. They're going to wipe him out. They're going to set up another king on his throne. What's he going to do? My, my dynasty's over. Even through all that, Isaiah can say, 
a virgin's going to conceive and a child's going to come forth. And in chapter 11, there's going to come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Because Isaiah understands and knows that God's in complete control of this thing. And none of this has got him shaken. He knows who's going to be inaugurated January 20th. None of it's got him upset. Look what, he, look what he says. For he saith, now he's talking about the Assyrian, verse 13. By the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom. The reason I've took the world, Brother John, is because I'm smart and I'm strong. And I am prudent. And I have removed the bounds of the people and robbed their treasures. I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand hath found as a nest, just like someone searching around for eggs. He says, the riches of the people, and I've... I've as one gathereth eggs that are left, I've gathered all the earth, and there was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth. or pain. No one could talk against him. I've done all this. I'm the great king of the Assyrian. You'll see it in uh, these later chapters when Rabshakeh comes against Jerusalem. Oh, we'll say it, the great king, the king of Assyria. He's done all this. He's, he's the one. But God said, I'll, I'll send him against. I'm the one that's really in charge of all this. Verse 15, shall the axe... Boast itself against him that heweth thereof? Or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it? They didn't have power saws. They had to shake them back and forth back in those days. As if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up, or if the staff shall lift up itself as if it were no wood. Uh, you've, you've said you've done all this, but you're really just a tool in the hand of the Lord to be used. You're going to stand up and boast against God? Tell God how big of a man you are? Isaiah doesn't think so. Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, send among his fat ones leanness. And he's going to punish him. He goes on and talks about how he's going to punish him. And then <clears throat> verse 20, again, here's our remnant theme. It shall come to pass in that day shall the remnant of Israel escape, such as escaped of the house of Jacob. Uh, and, and we're going to dig into that later, uh, the next part of this lesson when we, when we do that. But <clears throat> the important thing to see out of all this that we've talked about this morning, I wanted to lay out the historical context of it all. All these things look like, I, I mean, it just doesn't look good for Ahaz and the house of Judah and the house of David. But Isaiah wants everyone to know that God is in complete control of this. And the Assyrian's going to get punished for the attitude of his heart. Yeah, he's doing, the, he's doing what God is intending to judge God's people. But he's not doing it to glorify God. He's doing it because he's the great king. And he's going to do it. And he's going to do it. And he'll be punished for that too. And that there's a remnant going to be left. This remnant idea keeps coming up over and over and over again. And you'll see Paul grabbing that idea idea, excuse me, in, in uh, Romans chapter 9 and Romans chapter 11, there's going to be this remnant. It's the elect. It's the ones that God is redeeming. There's these ones, and, and so that's another theme to follow all the way through. And, uh, but I wanted to lay that foundation for the next lesson. <laughs> but like I said, Brother Steve, I wish I had about four hours this morning because there's a lot here. But we're going to stop there for now and pick up next time. We're going to backtrack and then grab chapters 11 and 12 and maybe a few more depending on how far I can get. So thank you.